I'm so excited about the series we've been in, talking about your best year. We started off talking about your best year spiritually, when you completely surrender yourself to God and begin each day with the Lord, it gives you an amazing year. We talked about then your best year relationally, how if we begin to serve one another, put the other person first, and, and literally follow the golden rule, which is to do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, that changes everything in your relationship. So last week, we talked about the 10 10 80 principle for your best year financially, tithing the first tenth to God, and then saving the second tenth and living on the 80%, which is a huge challenge, I know, but it will give you the results you're looking for to live a blessed financial life. And then today, I'm excited to talk about your best year emotionally. Honestly, you got to put everything together today, and here's why. Because the devil knows he can't take your gifts, but if he can get you distracted, discouraged, get you depressed, if he can get a hold of your mind, you won't use your gifts. So he's attacking your mind. So how can we have our best year emotionally? I want to unpack this today. I'm super excited. You guys ready to go? I'm ready to dive right in. Because I believe that that's what the devil does is his biggest attack on us is in our minds. Proverbs 4.23 says this, Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. The original language there for the word heart actually speaks of a deep inner thoughts. The deep inner thoughts in your mind. So it says guard your thoughts, basically. Guard what is going on in your mind. If you don't, your mind will literally become your enemy rather than your friend. So how do we do that? How do we guard our mind? Well, the first thing I want to tell you to do, number one, is to recognize you are in a battle for your mind. There is a battle going on. God is teaching you his ways. He wants you to follow his will. He's got big plans for your life, good plans for your life. But the devil begins to attack your mind to get you off of your game. You know, a, a, a great athlete will, will play their game. But when they come up against a really good opponent, that opponent knows to get in their head. If they can get in their head, they can throw them off their game. The devil knows you have greatness in you, so he wants to throw you off of your game by getting in your thoughts. So let's just unpack that. Let me give you a few things that we tend to do. 2 Corinthians 10 says this, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. This is how we take back our minds. Just because you have a thought doesn't mean it's true. Let me say that again. Just because you have a thought doesn't mean it's true. We think things that are wrong all the time, that are not accurate. Oh, everyone's out to get me. No, not everyone's out to get you. Oh man, the world's just falling apart. Your whole world's not falling apart. But we think these thoughts and it gets us in a place where we're off our game. So here's a few of the ways our mind begins to, to hurt us. And so maybe you'll find yourself in one of these. Maybe for you, you have the lustful mind. This is where the, 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 you always think, oh man, if I was just with someone else, then I'd be happy. This is the lustful mind, right? Or maybe the fear-filled mind. They're, they're, you're always waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like, I know work's going fine now, but I'm sure I'm going to lose my job in the next month. I know, you know, things are going fine now, but I'm sure the economy's going to tank us. You're always ready for the next shoe to drop, right? This is, how about this, the distracted mind. Now we have a device, a distraction device in our pocket everywhere we go. And so we have the distracted mind, right? And so this is a huge thing people keep falling into is that they're distracted. I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen students studying while they have their laptop on Netflix or their phone out, and they're literally it's looking at social media while they're studying. I mean, how much better would your grades be if you just put your phone and devices away and actually studied? You know, people are distracted at work now. They're clicking back and forth between emails and between, you know, and half those emails aren't even work-related. We're clicking back and forth between social media. We're distracted. We're not focused on what God wants us to be focused on. How about this, the bitter mind? This is a person who someone hurt you deeply and you're still mad about it. You're still focused on it. You're still angry about this. We talked about this in relational side of this message where we talked about how you may have them in a prison in your mind, but you realize you're the one in prison. You're only holding yourself back when you live bitter and angry. How about the negative mind? This is where you always find something wrong with everything that's right. You can always, right, you can always snatch a loss out of the jaws of a wind, right? You're like, oh, I don't know about that. And so you always find a negative. And then how about this one, the ungrateful mind? You know, we are given things in life, but oftentimes we're not grateful for them because we, they weren't earned. They were just given. People nowadays are all about their rights. I have a right to this and a right to that. When the truth is, is that we are given much of what we have and we should be grateful for those things. So I don't know about you, but I find myself somewhere in this. 
Maybe for you, I could have listed many others of selfish mind. You know, uh, maybe for you, um, it's something completely different. But I bet you'll find yourself in, in one of these mindsets. Here's what happens. When we get in this mindset, we begin to think, what's wrong with me? Man, I must be broken to have this lustful thoughts all the time. To, or maybe, maybe you have an envious mind, a covetous mind. You're always wanting what someone else has. And so you start, what's wrong with me? Why am I have a selfish mind? And my mindset's not right. So then we begin to play on our negativity, right? And so it begins to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like, oh, I'm so broken. I'm so messed up. Now you just got to clear your mind. But we begin to think those negative thoughts and it begins to break us when God has something better for us. I want to give you a quick illustration if I can. Do you mind coming up here real quick? Can I, can I have you come up? I want to use you for an illustration, okay? In a positive way, not use you in a bad way, in a good way. Come on up, man. Come on up. Come on. You got a Jesus t-shirt on, man. I got, let, get this guy a hand right here. So here's what I got. I want to give you 20 bucks. It's a pretty good deal, right? So how much is this worth? $20. $20. You're smart. This guy is really smart. <laughs> he nailed it. It's worth $20. Now, let me ask you this. If I give this to you, but now I crinkled it up. Now what's it worth? $20. It's still worth 20 bucks? No, come on. Okay, hold on a sec. Now what's it worth? 20 bucks. Really? So it's even when the world has beaten it up, crunched it up, trashed it, it doesn't lose its value. That's how God is, isn't it? Even when we've gone through some things, when our mind has been beat up and we feel negative and we've been through some stuff and we've been hurt, God says, the creator set your value. No matter what you've gone through, that doesn't change. God says you're of great value. That's for you, man. Congratulations. Take it. No, here you go. There you go. You're welcome. I want to encourage you today. No matter what you're going through, God says, I have greatness in you. It hasn't changed regardless of what's happened to you, where you've been, what you've done, who you've been with. None of that changes the fact that you are of great value to God. God made you in his image. And so you have greatness in you. We just have to clear out that mindset and begin to put the right mindset in place. So how do we do that? Let's get practical. Here's what what we need to do. We need to recognize, number one, that there is a battle going on in our mind, and we have all these different mindsets that are wrong, right? So how do you fix it? Jesus gives us a great hint on how we can fix it when he begins to talk to the Pharisees. The Pharisees were highly religious people that had the wrong mindset. Now, I'm sure none of us have that ever, right? High religious people. Is there any highly religious people in here that had the wrong mindset sometimes? I mean, I think all of us, whether we like it or not, sometimes are a Pharisee. Pharisees are really good at pointing out someone else's problem and really bad at recognizing their own. I know you're not guilty of this, but maybe you know someone who is. (laughs) So we all have this tendency, whether we like it or not, but Jesus calls out the Pharisees hard. Why was he so hard on the Pharisees? Because he knew he had to break this mindset. And so this is what he says to the Pharisees. He says this, you belong to your father, the devil. Man, he's going hard. And he says this, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. But there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. How do you know the devil's lying? Because his mouth is moving. He is always lying to us continually, okay? And so how do we fix this? Because the lies are what gives us the wrong mindset. Look what Jesus said in John chapter 8. He says, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you what? Free. Free. Truth sets you free. Now, the world has taken this phrase and used it in all the wrong ways. Oh, you just need to know the truth. The truth will set you free. Well, not all truth sets you free. You can know the truth about biology. It doesn't necessarily set you free. You can know the truth about, about you know, certain nutritional facts. That doesn't set you free. You know, you, you got to be careful. Not all truth sets you free. If you go tell your boss the truth about how you really feel, he may set you free. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> so not all truth sets you free. God's truth sets you free. Let's be real clear here. That's the truth that changes everything. So how do we clear out the negative mindset or the, the fearful mindset, the bitter mindset, the, the lustful mind, the distracted mind, the ungrateful? How do we clear it out? Here's how you do it. Number two, uncover the lies you believed and replace it with truth. So right now, here's what I want you to write down. If, if you, you know, pull out your notes, if you don't have the Church Unlimited app, by the way, all the notes are right there. Everything I'm talking about, is right. you have literally have my notes in front of you. So get the app, please do that. 
And so here's what I want to challenge you to do. You can fill in those blanks. I want to challenge you right now to write down the lie you've been believing. And so let me give you an example. Maybe lustful mind is your lie. Well, the TV in front of you is lying. I can promise you that. Here's what the TV is telling you. If you watch any movie, any TV show, Today's World, this is what they're trying to tell you. Married couples are boring. Single, sleeping around, that's the life. Name a show that doesn't teach you that. I mean, all shows nowadays, that's what they teach you. It's always if you are married, you've settled down, and now your life is boring, and if you are single and sleeping around, that's the way to live. That's the lie that they're telling you. It's the exact opposite of that, by the way. Most single people I know are very lonely and wish they could find the right person that God has for them and be married. And so I just want to tell you, it's, it's a lie, right? That may be the lie you're falling for, and so be careful about the lie you're giving into. Or the lie for young people is, you know, skip what God says, don't bother, bother with his rules and just jump in the sack with someone and that'll make you happy. But why are so many people broken from that? Because it's a lie, right? Maybe for you it's not that. Maybe for you, uh, you have the, the distracted mind. Your mind is always uh, on other things. Or I like to call it the envious mind, right? Because we have envy machines in our pockets now, right? And so you can scroll and see, oh, wow, their life looks so great. So now we have FOMO. You know, FOMO is this fear of missing out. Oh, I got to check my, my social media to see what I'm missing. Have you figured out yet that you're really not missing much? It's just kind of the same stuff again and again. And so, but we think we're missing, so we have this FOMO, fear of missing out. I like to replace it with JOMO. This is the joy of missing out. I don't need to know about everything going on in the world. I need to know what's going on in my world, what God has for me, and, and, and the focus that God has for my life. Does that make sense? So I want to challenge you. That's a lie that you're missing out on something you're not. And here's the other lie. The lies that go something like this. Oh, their life is so great, and my life is so terrible. When here's the truth, their life is not as great as they're making it appear, and your life is not as bad as you think it is. That's the truth. But many times we fall for this, this lie. So uncover the lie, and you'll get unstuck. Tell me where you're stuck in your life, and I'll tell you where you've begun to believe a lie. If you can, if you can discover the lie, and then you can replace it with truth, then you will no longer be stuck in that area of your life. So I just want to challenge you. Maybe, maybe the negative, fearful-filled mind is you. And you say, man, I, everything's going to fall apart. But let's discover the truth on this. How much of the things that you feared in the past actually happened? Very little. Let's just be honest. But yet we live in fear of something happening when it hasn't. And even for those who something like that has happened to, they get through it and they're fine. So I just want to challenge you I'm not trying to belittle your situation, but I want you to understand, most fears never come to reality. And so we need to recognize the lie that says we're always around the corner from some huge problem going to happen to us and take us down when God instead will take care of you. So uncover the lie. Now, this next thing I want to tell you, I want to encourage you with, that th th this next one's huge because this will really help shift your mindset out of an emotional uh, roller coaster into emotional health. But listen, young people, I want to talk to young people right now if I can, especially students. The devil is attacking your generation the most when it comes to lies. In fact, Proverbs actually calls all of us at times fools. But he has a different word for young fools. He calls them simpletons, which means they just don't know any better. So what happened is as parents, because we wanted to protect you, believe it or not, we gave you a phone to know where you are, to be able to check up on you, so if you get lost, you can call us, that kind of thing. It's so funny how we did it, to protect you. We didn't realize that when we handed you that, we actually handed you probably more danger in your hands than actually protection. And then now you've got access to things that we never had access to. And so you're learning things, and so you learn about relationships in all the wrong way, you learn about sex in all the wrong way. You learn about different values in all the wrong way, and it's breaking a generation. It really is. And now we have people so confused, so messed up, they can't even get the most basic things right about their identity anymore. And so I just want to challenge you that the devil's coming after you. This is why we believe so much in having students, young people involved in church, because God will set you free from that garbage if you get around the right young people. And so I want to challenge you with this. We're actually doing something with our youth group. I'm really excited about what's going on in our student ministry. They have done a rebrand, but it's not just a rebrand. It's, it's, a, it's a new mindset for how they're looking at student ministry. Check this video out.
In a world full of distractions, fear, and doubt, we gather from near and far, seeking a place of hope, a place of peace, a place to belong. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. These words resonate in our hearts, propelling us forward with purpose. We aren't just the leaders of tomorrow, we're the leaders of today. We are Youth Unlimited. I want to challenge you students to bring your friends with you. Say, oh, I don't know anyone in youth group. First of all, you're going to walk in, you're going to know half the room. Be like, oh, I go to school with half these students. So just come, bring a friend with you if you're nervous about coming for the first time. And parents, drop them off. I want to encourage you. It needs to be like brushing your teeth. You don't have an option with that because you're going to have rotted teeth if you don't. If you don't get your students involved in a youth group and around the right students, trust me, the devil would love to rot their soul before they even get a chance in life. And so it makes me so angry that the devil's going after our youth. It angers me so much that we now have education teaming up with this. Now we have, you know, I mean, it's bad enough we're battling the world. Now we don't realize we're not getting educated, we're getting indoctrinated. It's ridiculous. We have to change this mindset. I thank God for Christian teachers still in our schools. I thank God for youth ministers, and, and, and I thank God for coaches that still care and that are pushing the right agenda to say, no, 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 you don't need to fall for this junk. I want to challenge you. Get around the right people. But listen, frankly, you know who's also distracted and consuming all this junk? Adults. We are too. We fall for it too. So I want to challenge you to begin to rethink this. So what can we do to really get our mindset straight? Well, first of all, recognize where, you're, where the battlefield is for your mind, right? And then, and then do what? Uncover the lie. And then, and then what's the next thing? This is huge. Number three, spend less time consuming, more time creating. Spend less time consuming media, the wrong kinds of media, and more time creating the life that you want. Philippians 4 says this, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Now, I don't know what the last Snapchat you looked at was, but was it pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy? Was the last video or meme you watched any of those things? I just want to challenge you. And there are good people and good things to follow. I'm not suggesting there's not. But you got to start thinking about what you're thinking about. What you put in front of you determines your thoughts. It really does. There is an algorithm feeding your addictions. I promise you, there's an algorithm feeding the junk that you've begun to click on and follow. And so that algorithm may even be more honest than you are with your own heart. So I want to challenge you to begin to change the algorithm by changing what you follow. Psalms 119 says, I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. Get into the Word of God and it will really change your life. Genesis 1, this is when we begin to shift and really see things positive happen in our life. Genesis 1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Psalms 33 explains the creation this way. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry hosts by the breath of his mouth. Your words become a self-fulfilling prophecy in your life. So begin to speak your life up. Begin to speak faith. Begin to say, I believe God has great things for me. Let me give you an example. So we, we begin to speak negative, limited things. Like maybe you say something like this, I'm not really good with money. Or you say, I'm just never going to get that from, or I haven't got that promotion. Or I'm still single. Let me change your language. How about, I'm not good with money yet. I haven't got that promotion yet. I haven't gotten married yet. Are you seeing where I'm going here? Isn't it funny how one word changes everything? One word can bring hope. And so begin to change your mindset and begin to speak words of faith over your own life and watch that begin to happen. Someone needs to get excited because God's already said you have greatness in you. You have to speak those words over your life. And so be careful what you're consuming and start creating the life that you want. What are we really talking about here? We're talking about something we started at the very beginning, beginning of the year with. It's our word for the year. We're talking about sowing in a new way so you begin to reap in a new way, right? Galatians 6, verse 7, whatever a man sows, he shall also reap. So if you sow just consuming, 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 you're still just going to be there and be affected by all the stuff you consume. But if you begin to create 
Create the life you want. Create the body you want. Going to the gym. Create the mind you want. Studying. Create the health you want. Create the spirituality you want by being involved in life group, by serving in the church. Create the heart you want by being generous. If you begin to do those things, you'll have a different life. Get out of consumption. Get into contribution. Did you catch that? Shift your mindset. Are you here today to be a consumer of church or a contributor to church? Are you going to just consume what God wants for you? Or are you going to contribute to the God, God's plan for your life? Does that make sense? And so when you go to work, is it like, well, they haven't given me a raise? I'm not supposed to give you a raise. That's consumption mentality. I'm going to contribute more to the company to where they want to value me more by giving me a raise. Does that make sense? And so shift your mindset from consumption to contributing, to creating the life that you want. People who have a great future in their life, create it. Oh, I wish I could be a CEO of a company. You know, almost every CEO of a company was the founder of that company. They created it. That's why they're in that spot. And so I want to challenge you to begin thinking differently. And if you'll do that, you'll get a different result. And here's what creating leads to. Let's shift our mindset. Here's what happens. When you begin to create the life you want, it leads to a loving mind, a faithful mind, a focused mind, a forgiving mind, a positive mind, a grateful mind. Doesn't that sound a lot better? Shift out of consumption to creating the life that you want. Now you may say, Pastor, that's great, but I still feel stuck. Can I tell you what's getting you stuck? Let's talk about this. I want to show you something in Scripture. Psalms 147. This is such, such a powerful Scripture. We forget it often. It says, He heals the brokenhearted, and He binds up their wounds. Now notice the Scripture doesn't say, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up those who have wounds. It doesn't say that. That would have been an easy clarification for the Word of God to have. Is if you have a wound, I'll heal it. No, he says, I'll heal your wound. How, how does God know that? Well, because God made you. So God knows that we all have a wound without exception. Every one of us has a wound. John Eldridge writes it in his book, Wild at Heart. He talks to men. His book sold like crazy and exploded across the nation and men's ministry. Why? Because he's one of the first people who talked about what's called the father wound. A lot of people have a father wound. Maybe for you it's not a father wound. Maybe it wasn't the father leaving you or leaving the family. Maybe it was, he, was, he was harsh with his words. He was too disciplinary, never encouraged you. Maybe you have a mother wound. Maybe you had a critical mom who could always find the fault in anything you were doing. Maybe your wound has nothing to do with your parents. Maybe your wound was because you took a deep rejection or someone touched you or did something inappropriate to you at a very young age and, and you still remember that to this day. Where's your wound? I didn't think I had one until I went to counseling. And I began to talk about it. I said, why am I stuck in this particular area of my life? And my counselor said, well, where's your wound? I said, I don't have one of those. I, I didn't go through anything harsh. I, I, I got great parents. I, they said, no, where's your wound? Where were you rejected? Where were you hurt? And I was like, well, I mean, he said, just tell me. Anytime you've ever... And I began to unpack this time in my life. I thought, oh my goodness, I didn't even realize. I was deeply wounded. And he said, well, so you were hurt? Yeah. By one or two people? No, the whole group. Really? And I had not thought of it. I was like, yeah, I was ostracized by this whole group of people that, that were supposed to love me and accept me. And I didn't, I thought, I, I, I didn't realize I was functioning out of my wound. Anyone else relate to what I'm talking about? Are you functioning, or better, should I say, dysfunctioning out of your wound? Now, I'm not trying to make light of this and say you can heal everything in one sermon, but I want you to hear God's words. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He will begin healing you. So look at this next scripture. I'm going to pray for you in a moment. We're going to ask God to begin healing for you, but I want to show you that scripture. Here's how healing really begins. It doesn't just begin with prayer. It begins when you do one more step, and if you don't do this next step, you will not have your healing really happen. I just need to warn you about this. If you leave this undone, you'll be living with your wound. Can you imagine if you were running or jogging, and you fell, and you broke your arm, getting up and continuing to run? Who would do that? I mean, no, you'd be like, are you crazy? I broke my arm. I'm not going to, uh, I'm just going just gonna to finish this job real quick. And then I'll get, I mean, you're like, of course not. You're going to immediately say, I need some help. Someone get me to a hospital. Jesus said the hospital is for the sick. He was referring to the church. He was saying, if you'll come in, God will bring in to heal you. 
But how many of us are still running the race with a deep wound? And we're wondering why we're not getting anywhere. There's a brokenness in us that needs to be healed. So here's that next step. James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be what? Healed. So healing begins when I share my wound. When I tell someone else where I've been hurt. That's the beginning of healing. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. One time I called the counselor and I started talking. I talked to him, the guy for an hour. I think he said three words. I kid you not. At the end of it, I just said, oh man, I know the hour's up. Oh, that was so great. Thank you so much. That was a huge help. He had told me nothing. But I had just blah, vomited for an hour. And I realized there was actually healing in even me hearing my own wound out loud. Saying it to someone else. I was beginning the healing process without even realizing I didn't even know what to do yet. But the healing had already begun because you can't fix what you won't acknowledge. But if you'll just admit it to someone else, God can begin to heal you no matter what you've gone through, what someone did to you or what you've done to someone else or even to yourself. God can begin to heal you. We all have a wound. Dr. Gardner Taylor was doing some lectures back during the Depression years at Harvard Divinity School. I know that sounds hilarious to put the word Harvard with the Divinity School, but that's how they started. He was doing these lectures and he shared a story that he went to preach in a rural black church in Louisiana. This is when electricity had just really begun. The light bulb had just been created, so there were very few electric electric outlets and so this little black church had one light bulb at the top of the room that's all they had very it was very dark he was preaching the best he could he could barely see anyone and then midway through his message the light went out and he was just sat there you know what to do until one of the men from the very back said preach on preacher we can see jesus in the dark that sometimes we need to recognize that Jesus is with you in the dark. He can still see you. Can you see him? He wants to heal your wound today. There's this great tradition that a Native American tribe has where they take a 13-year-old boy and they blindfold him. They take him deep into the woods. And this is the night he becomes a man. This is the rite of passage. They take him deep into the woods, and then they unblindfold him around midnight. It's pitch black, super dark, thick woods. You can't see anything. And they leave him for the night to survive on his own, to find warmth, to cuddle up, to tuck himself away, to protect himself from the animals until the morning when the light comes out and you can see where he's at and wander back out of the woods back home. This boy is taken into the woods He's blindfolded. They spin him around multiple times, take him a roundabout way where he has no idea where he's at. They place him in the middle of the woods, uncover his face, and then they leave. He sat there like any young boy would, hearing every sound, every crinkle of a leaf, every broken twig, thinking there's an animal coming to get me. He was nervous. He was paranoid. He was looking around. He could barely see in front of himself. He, I mean, he's just, it was pitch. He knew if I ran in any direction, I'll fall down. I'll probably run into a tree. So all he could do is just stay and survive. He found leaves and other covering and tried to cover himself up so he could be warm. He just sat there with his eyes wide open all night long. It felt like eternity until eventually, slowly, the darkness lifted and it became early, early morning. There was a dense fog. He could barely see anything. Eventually, he could just see the trees right around him. Then he began to notice the flowers he could finally see he could see the leaves everywhere. And about that time he turned, it kind of startled him. And he saw a large man only 10 feet away. It was his father the whole time with a bow and arrow ready to protect his son if anything came for him. When you feel alone, when you feel like there's no one there, your heavenly father is armed to protect you at all times.
You're not alone. You're not alone. Would you bow your heads with me, every head bowed, every eye closed, and we just take a moment to pray. How is God beginning to speak to you about that wound? God may be saying, because of that wound, it's what created the lustful mind. It's what created the fear-filled mind, the distracted mind, the negative mind, the bitter mind, the ungrateful mind. It's the wound. If that's you today, let's begin the process. Just lift your hand high and say, God, please begin to heal my wound. With your hand raised, would you make a commitment to say, God, I'm going to share it with someone this week. I'm going to talk to someone about this because I keep going into the same patterns, Pastor. I keep running into the same mindsets, and I believe there's a lie I've fallen for. And I'm tired of running with a broken arm. I'm tired of running with a wound. It's slowing me down. God, begin to heal me from the inside out. You are not what you did. You are not what was done to you. That $20 bill didn't lose value because it was stepped on. You don't lose value either because you've been trampled on. Let God renew you. Let God change you and begin to heal your heart right now. Just ask him, Jesus, heal me. Renew me. Help me to quit living the lie. I no longer want to believe the wrong thoughts about myself. And I know, God, the whole time I'm in the dark, you've been there protecting me. I thank you for that, God. Your head bowed and your eyes closed. God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for you. Jesus rose again from the grave, proving that he is God. That is the difference between our faith and all other faiths. All faiths around the world have founders. And all those founders say the same thing. Oh, follow this way. Do this or do that. And then one day maybe you'll get to eternity and it'll be good for you. But no, Jesus didn't say that. He said, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. No one gets to the Father but through me. He said, he said you'll follow me. He said, I'm going to die. And I'm going to come back three days later. He told his disciples this. They looked like he was crazy. Like, what are you talking about, Jesus? He says, no, I'm serious. I'm going to die. I'm going to raise again. Then he did it. He proved that he's God. That is why we can believe on facts, on truth, that he rose again. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, receive Jesus right now as your Lord and your Savior. Pray this prayer. Just say, dear Jesus, I realize I need you. I believe you died for my sin, and I believe you rose again. I ask you to come into my heart, be my Lord, and be my Savior. I repent of my sins. I put you in first place. Thank you, Jesus. For saving me. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you just gave your life to Christ, would you hold your hand high? If you just gave your life to Christ, hold your hand high. Thank you. There are hands going up all across our churches. Praise God. Hold your hand high. Thank you. Right here at the broadcast, all the way in the back. Praise God. Thank you. Right here in the front as well. Thank you. We see your hands. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Hold those hands high. Thank you, Rodfield. Hold that hand high. We see your hands there. Thank you, Stone Oak. Hold that hand high. Praise God. Thank you, Portland. Praise God. Right there at Rockport Fulton. Thank you. Hold your hand high. Right there at Padre Island. God's moving. Praise God. If you're online with us, you can let us know your hand's raised. Just simply text us right now in the, in the text box. Say, my hand's raised. Or click hand raised right now. Come on. Online, you're a part of this. You're not, listen, you're not just watching this message. You're in this message. This is just for you. You're a part of this congregation. If you just gave your life to Christ, let us know. Text us right now. Be bold to say, I did it. I prayed that prayer. I asked Jesus in my heart. Just let us know right now. We celebrate with you. Praise God. Let us know. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's so true. Thank you, God, that you heal our wound. And Father, thank you that after that healing, Lord, you begin to give us the right mindset. So Lord, help us, God, to not have a distracted mind, a negative mind, a fear-filled mind. Lord, instead, we need to have a loving mind, a focused mind, a purpose-filled mind, a mind of Christ. Thank you for your word today. May we have our best year emotionally because we are right with you and thinking the right thoughts. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Isn't God good? His word is so true.